This is episode 76 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico podcast. I'm Paul Gessing. And I'm Wally Drangmeister. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. This and every week we'll be talking to you about public policy issues facing New Mexico. Wally, it is, uh, we're finally coming down the home stretch of the 2019 legislative session. And I think when all the dust clears, it will wind up being potentially less damaging than expected going in. Although we've got, you know, several days to go still Uh, by the next podcast, we will know where things stand essentially in terms of legislative passage of bills. But uh, it was a rough seven days between uh, the last podcast and today for some of the Rio Grande Foundation's uh, cherished values of limited government. And I'll just start off with HB 85 has passed both houses and the right to work ban is on the way, if not on the governor's desk, where it will undoubtedly be signed. So a lot of work, a lot of travel, a lot of, uh, you know, time and expense uh, spent by the Rio Grande Foundation, our coalition partners, Americans for Prosperity, uh, New Mexico Business Coalition, and many others, unfortunately, flushed down the toilet. Yes, a very disappointing piece of uh, piece of legislation that almost assuredly will be signed by the governor. And then uh, what was interesting about that one is basically uh, HB 85 is saying that uh, counties and municipalities are preempted from doing this. This is the purview of the state. Uh, it was interesting. I heard some debate on the min- on the minimum wage bill where they went and cut and paste that exact language from HB 85 into the minimum wage bill and said, well, if it's good to preempt things like this, why don't we preempt minimum wages? And then it was, uh, it reminded me of the, uh, old characters from the Muppet show. There's harumphing and guffawing about that's not how that was meant to work, but it is interesting. This whole issue about where law is made. And this is one that's really sad just for the simple reason is that the, uh, as states that, uh, put right to work into place, uh, have better outcomes economically than those that don't, but it boiled down to just a raw political battle, uh, I would suspect primarily by the unions. And if you're paying attention, it certainly looked that way. And they come in, they came out with uh, their position intact. No doubt about it. The vote was 23 to 19 in the Senate house uh, also passed it on largely party line votes. Although a couple of Democrats, I think voted against the, the ban in the house. The numbers were sufficiently, disparate that it really didn't matter. Uh, Not enough Democrats were ever going to come over to the right to work side. In the Senate, 23-19 is a pretty close vote. Um, And Clemente Sanchez of Grants, uh, Mary Kay Papin of Las Cruces, and John Arthur Smith of Deming all supported local right to work. Interestingly enough, and this is kind of just an aside, uh, but 2015, we were talking right to work at the state level with Governor Martinez in office. And we needed three votes from three Democrats in the Senate. Could have had a tie-breaking vote with John Sanchez as Mm -hmm. lieutenant governor. And all of New Mexico could have been right to work if these three or some other combination of three Democrats in the state Senate had uh, helped embrace right to work. Uh, they did not at the time, and it was very unfortunate. Uh, you know, we do applaud uh, Clemente Sanchez, Mary Kay Papin, and John Arthur Smith for standing up for local governments. But man, it would have been awesome if they had done this in 2015, and the whole state of New Mexico could have been right to work. Yes, uh, it is interesting how these votes are fluid depending on whether uh, one party or another is in charge, and we've seen uh, certain votes that. Uh, Back when that really, really mattered, those votes were not there, and now it didn't matter as much. They were there, so uh, it's interesting to see if uh, votes like that, uh, and again, not casting dispersion, those are three fine, fine legislators uh, by any way, any political uh, 
methodology you use to analyze them. So I'm not casting any personal, but it is interesting. Uh, sometimes there's ceremonial votes that are put forward and boy, it would have been nice to have a real vote a few years ago when the house was Republican. No doubt about it. Uh, also it was a big week, a bad week in many respects for SB 489. Well, the bill had a good week because it's a bad bill. Uh, this is the one that is going to shutter the San Juan generating station and jack up your electricity prices over the next decade or so by implementing a 50% renewable mandate. Uh, it is on to the house. In fact, as we record this podcast on Monday afternoon, uh, this evening, the House Judiciary Committee is supposed to take up this particular legislation. Uh, given that it's Michelle Lujan Grisham's, Grisham's one of her top priorities to essentially uh, punish ratepayers and bail out PM uh, and really punish the four corners, unfortunately, uh, this thing is likely to fly through the House by next week. But you never know, something could jump up and get in the way. Uh, the disappointing thing was, uh, Wally, that most of the Republicans, especially Metro Albuquerque Republicans, jumped on board with this horrendous legislation. A few Democrats peeled off and voted against it. Uh, Bill Sewell's would be one. And uh, you know, while he may not be on the same wavelength reasoning wise, but he, he at least voted against SB 489. And that's a good thing. Uh, and of course, uh, Bill Scher, Farmington area state senator, heroically uh, spoke filibustered, the New Mexico filibuster. It's the first time I've seen that in my 13 years at the Rio Grande Foundation. Scher occupied the floor of the Senate for about four hours, putting many in danger of not making the charity basketball game that evening. It was quite an exhibition. I was there in the gallery watching uh, just a very, very interesting events and unfortunate that we got such a, a lopsided vote out of the Senate. Well, the issue uh, that Cher was filibustering is there is a, uh, a deal afoot to uh, keep San Juan generating station open by adding, by having a buyer come in buy the plan and then adding a carbon capture and sequestration uh, facility on that using this chemical called amine that will uh, absorb carbon dioxide, capture it and put it in a pipeline. And it is interesting. There's a there's an interesting group. You have the new energy economy that is really opposing 489 for uh, some economic reasons and the fact that they hate everything. Uh, but also then you have the Four Corners trying to get an exception to uh, to this bill or to make it at least uh, possible for them to keep that plan open. And, and uh, one of the points that I that Cher made was that, you know, what what – New Mexico does with regard to coal and natural gas fired generation in the big scheme of things isn't going to make a whole big difference worldwide. But uh, if they were able to keep that plant open, maybe uh, that could uh, pave the way for other places that are certainly not going to get rid of coal in our lifetime, notably China and India. But uh, despite the fact that he talked for four, almost four hours, uh, nothing came of that. And we'll see if those uh, amendments get put on in the House. But 489, um, I think when we look back, you know, uh, the potential impacts that you have analyzed at the uh, Rio Grande Foundation, uh, it's not a tax increase per se, but it's government implementing something that is going to cost the uh, citizens of New Mexico dearly, particularly those in uh, Albuquerque and Santa Fe. And we may look back here in a few years and uh, say, oh my goodness, what were we thinking? What were we doing? Because that's certainly where uh, many in the state of California have gotten on a similar plan. They're a few years ahead of us here in New Mexico. And, uh, you know, in analyzing the legislation coming out of the uh, 2019 session, uh, in my estimation, HB 85, of course, that's the right to work ban. SB 489, that's the uh, dismantling of San Juan Generating Station and uh, presumed uh, dramatic increases in your uh, electricity costs over the next decade or so, a renewable mandate. Those are the two worst bills uh, still moving in the session, still likely to pass and uh, be signed into law. The third is just the 11% 
budget increase that we saw uh, pass pretty quickly at the beginning of the session. Uh, those are the the three worst bills that I see coming into law in uh, this particular legislative session. Those are very bad, uh, and SB 489 in particular is going to have uh, ramifications into the future. However, I'm going out a little bit out on the limb here, and I'm going to say that HB 6 is unlikely to pass, and uh, I'll tell you why in a second, which is, Uh, A tweet from Dan Boyd at the Albuquerque Journal. John Arthur Smith, the influential chairman of the Senate Rules Committee, says, I I believe he's referring to the finance, he corrected that in a subsequent tweet, says he doesn't support sweeping tax, uh, the tax reform or tax package. They keep on calling it reform. It's a tax hike. It's a tax grab, $350 million annually. That's HB6. As Smith put it on the Senate floor, this is not spending money in a responsible fashion. And, uh, God bless them. When it comes to finances, unfortunately, right to work, not the same way. But when it comes to spending and taxing, Senate uh, Finance Committee Chairman John Arthur Smith wields uh, a very big stick up there. And I don't think we are going to see uh, a a lot of tax increases. Maybe something will sneak through. But uh, with a billion dollars surplus available, I don't expect we're going to see certainly the full package of tax increases, maybe something like the internet sales tax sneaks through. Well, and then the other thing that kind of came about, and I'm not sure, and I don't even have the bill number in front of me, I should have looked that up, is there's what's called the junior spending bill, which was the pork bill. So you have the, uh, you know, the basically HB1 typically is the the overall budget for the state. Uh, This is, this is basically pork operating that that's divvied up by legislature le, legislator and we haven't had the money as a state to do that that is back in conjunction with uh the potential tax increases by the bill you just spoke about so uh not good from many points of view it's not good public policy to uh just give each legislator some uh walking around money if you will to fund pet projects we've proven in the capital uh, arena for years that we get uh hundreds and hundreds of projects that funds are allocated to and then are never completed and then that money just sits there basically uh on the sidelines uh a lot of this money is in addition to capital's operating money that's put towards things that are of dubious distinction, particularly if you're a taxpayer in New Mexico. No doubt about it. And a couple of other interesting bills uh, in the session. Marijuana legalization may have a chance after all. I thought with the distance between the, the House and the Senate that it was unlikely that marijuana legalization would pass. But uh, after the House, in a rare display of moderation, they abandoned essentially uh, You could call it the more free market model uh, when it comes to pot of uh, Colorado, private uh, stores, et cetera, private distribution network, still heavy taxes, but they abandoned that in the House, passed a bill very narrowly, 36 to 34, uh, that would put the state in charge of managing the distribution network. Uh, You know, you'd have much more of a state run liquor store kind of setup for Uh, marijuana in the state of New Mexico. And uh, that is a model that was put forth by a handful of Republicans in in the state Senate. And it seems to at least have gotten some traction. It passed the Public Affairs Committee in the Senate on a five to two vote. We'll see what happens with marijuana, but this they could have stumbled upon the ticket here in terms of marijuana legalization, putting it under a more robust state uh, authority. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, in the uh, vernaculars of the 60s and 70s uh, that I did live through a bit, uh, going to go find the man to get my marijuana. Well, in this case, it may be the same man that makes the rules and uh, collects the taxes as well. Just uh, expansive. Uh, we'll have to see what that would look like. Uh, it's kind of a scary thought to me to uh, what a, uh, a state of New Mexico run retail outlet selling marijuana would look like, but we may get a chance to see that. Yeah, uh, that certainly gives everybody <laughs> who follows anything in New Mexico government heartburn. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll find out together. I mean, 
to its credit, New Mexico, unlike a lot of states, states that in many ways are very good on public policy across the board, uh, Virginia is a pretty darn free market state, and yet they have a uh, state-run liquor uh, establishment. And so it's not entirely unheard of. It's a pretty unique model as far as the marijuana industry goes. Uh, also, and there's so many things to talk about, but uh, the minimum wage has kind of uh, evolved during the session, and uh, it looks like the Senate is at least getting uh, bending the house to its will. Uh, Clemente Sanchez, state senator from Grants, introduced uh, legislation to get us to an $11 minimum wage. The rate is $7.50 an hour. Uh, no automatic increases. The tipped wage for restaurant employees still would be in existence. You'd also have some training wages for uh, uh, new workers at given places like high school students, et cetera. Uh, so a more palatable version of the minimum wage. No minimum wage is the right approach. Uh, wages should be decided in a market by willing workers and willing employers, but uh, not the necessarily uh, death knell in many ways for these local communities that we expected out of the house. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's going to pass at this point, but uh, it, because the bill had Minimum wage had gone through the House in its original form. The Senate then took it apart, passed their own, and now it's coming back to the House. So we're running out of time. Uh, hopefully they do run out of time. But uh, minimum wage looks like it's going to be uh, moderated rather dramatically. Yeah, I, I watched quite a quite lengthy hearings uh, in the Senate on that uh, against my will. Uh, and uh, it was very, it was very interesting. Uh, the discussion, the uh, one of the interesting facts is that because uh, Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and Las Cruces already have their own minimum wage, uh, the biggest impact of this will be felt in rural New Mexico, the smaller counties, some of which don't have the most robust economies. So you know, the way I view it is, you have Albuquerque, Cruces, uh, Santa Fe. They already have local ordinances. The southeast New Mexico, you can't get somebody to work at your McDonald's for less than twelve, fifteen dollars an hour. So it's going to be the the places like the Claytons and the Ratones and some of those others that, uh, if their economies are struggling, they may feel the brunt of it. And uh, I do believe that that's the beginning of, uh, or actually that's the second of a kind of rural urban divide that I'm really seeing in the, the legislature where things that sound good to the uh, legislators in uh, Albuquerque and Santa Fe do not sound good to the folks in the rural. And uh, like we've seen, uh, at least with uh, some of the, uh, the gun legislation, uh, maybe they will make their uh, displeasure known at some point in the future if, if that happens and it really does hurt their economies. Which uh, data shows it will. Yeah, it is, uh, th this is definitely an urban-rural divide. And of course, it's no coincidence that uh, Sanchez is both a state senator and a state senator from Grants, which is a relatively economically challenged area of our state, trying to make sure that the minimum wage does not get too out of line. And uh, I've talked to some folks, and they expect that the House will try to monkey around with aspects of the Senate-passed wage uh, bill and it'll be interesting because if the if the house then you know amends their that that bill uh, then it's going to have to come back to the senate and we could be at an impasse situation which again is the ideal uh, for free market economics and low wage workers alike uh, although those low wage workers probably don't know it yet because uh, if you're earning seven dollars and fifty cents or eight dollars an hour. You don't have a heck of a lot of time to think about what's going on in Santa Fe. You're busy trying to do your best to pay your bills uh, regardless. Uh, and all of this discussion about the legislature leads me to uh, discuss the Freedom Index, uh, our tracking site, which we rate every bill from a negative eight to a plus eight. Uh, we're a week out. It's taking shape rather dramatically, Wally. Uh, you can find this data available at RioGrandeFoundation.org. We've got a full-time staffer up in Santa Fe looking through all the bills, uh, trying to parse what is in them, not just from their titles, but from actually what's written and how they're going to impact your freedom. Uh, as it stands now, and Rod Montoya of the Four Corners, Farmington area has been leading the charge. 
in terms of uh, limited government, followed by uh, Candy Azell, David Gallegos. These are all representatives from rural areas of New Mexico. Rachel Black, uh, she's new from Alamogordo, replacing a vet Harold. James Strickler from San Juan County. Larry Scott, Phelps Anderson, and so on. Uh, those are some of your top performers. Now, uh, those were all members of the House. Uh, shockingly, Wally, the uh, state senator with the highest score in our Freedom Index is Cisco McSorley. Cisco has the advantage of not having served at all in the legislature <laughs> this session. And so he got a zero. He got a zero. He was replaced by someone else. Which puts him <laughs> at the very top of the state Senate, not just among Democrats, but among Republicans uh, and everyone. The state Senate has not taken as many economically uh, challenging votes, SB 489 being one of the most. And of course, as I said, a lot of Republicans followed the Democrats on that. So uh, they hurt their scores. But uh, Senator Mark Moores of people who actually are serving in Santa Fe has the highest score, just a minus two, but he needs to do a little bit better to get past old Cisco McSorley <laughs> and his big fat zero. And of course, uh, it is worth noting that in our freedom index, you get pluses for voting for the good bills, but you get minuses for voting for the bad bills. It's not just a, a zero, you get a negative. So you have to earn your uh, positive score in our Freedom Index. Now, uh, looking over at the bottom of this whole uh, disaster that is the Dumpster Fire 2019 legislative session, the very worst performer is one Eliseo Al Alcon. Uh, he, at, right, at this point, has a negative 284 uh, point total. So he has voted for a whole lot of bad bills uh, Cheryl Stapleton, a uh, APS flunky who also is in the legislature. She's at negative 280. She's working hard to uh, surpass Eliseo Alcon as being the worst legislator. Joy Garrett, a freshman, I believe she ran against David Adkins and this time won uh, negative 278. Melanie Stansbury, another freshman. Uh, Deborah Sarnana, Another freshman, and then our old friend, and I use that very advisedly, Damon Eli, he of the sponsorship of the uh, anti-right to work HB 285 to kill right to work in New Mexico at the local level. He's at negative 273. So uh, some pretty uh, astonishingly bad scores in our Freedom Index. It's not a surprise given the tenor of things up in Santa Fe, but you all want to check that out. I assure you, legislators look at where they are, especially um, people who care about limited government and freedom. Uh, there's not there's a vanishingly small number of those, so maybe not all of them care, but uh, they do get those scores, and uh, we will let them know when they are scoring well or scoring extremely poorly. And unfortunately, there's way too many of the latter. Well, I, I think the uh, the uh, index is fascinating, and that you can go in and uh, the bills that I knew the most about, I went in and checked them to see what their point value was, and it, the, typically these were negative. Not surprisingly, uh, four eighty nine uh, had a pretty high negative six. I think that it would be you know is a disastrous uh, economic freedom bill for New Mexico, for example. So uh, I will say uh, nicely done, and uh, it, it, is, uh, it is interesting. Uh, no one is close to getting 100, but some are way better than others. No doubt about it. You definitely see the, and again, these are floor votes. We wish we could do uh, committee votes, and a lot of folks do yeoman's work in committee, stopping a lot of bad bills, not as much as has been done in previous sessions because the numbers are so out of whack, especially in the House. But uh, we try to... Uh, give some data to understand where things are actually going uh, with individual legislators and overall in the session. You can go back and use that data. And it's a great repository for anybody who wants to run for office, especially in the legislature here in New Mexico. Uh, we have a, speaking of HB6, uh, the next point on the agenda, and again, I always use this caution whenever I talk about Wallet Hub. Wallet Hub does some fantastic work and they do some pretty low quality work. Uh, I cited a report from Wallet Hub that you can find 
uh, for yourself and read through it. I think it's pretty darn good uh, at errorsofenchantment.com. And uh, this report breaks down tax burdens in New Mexico based on income level. (coughs) And specifically, we're going to talk about uh, low income and high income earners because uh, folks on the left, uh, progressives, especially in the House, have been selling their HB6 tax grab as a step towards uh, a more equitable tax policy in the state. Basically, the idea is uh, in taxation that states that rely on consumption and sales taxes tend to have what are called regressive taxes because they're charged at the same rate. And if you're charged at the same rate, you are going to be charging people of lower incomes. You're going to be consuming, government is, a slightly higher percentage of their their annual income than if you uh, have an income-based tax structure, especially a progressive income tax structure. Now, New Mexico's income tax system is not especially progressive. Uh, federal is the poster child for a progressive income tax. California also, with its top state rate at 13 Uh, 0.3% is incredibly progressive. But uh, when it comes to New Mexico, uh, Wallet Hub, look in, again, this is available at areasofenchantment.com. For low-income folks, New Mexico is 41st. That means uh, we are one of the more regressive states. Our our tax code uh, does impact low-income people. So 41st is, is bad. It's heavy. It's a high burden. So we have a relatively high burden. Going around the, the, the neighbors, Arizona's at 42nd, Utah at 4th, which is interesting, Colorado at 11th, and Texas at 44th. So you really have that, that bottom tier, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, with relatively high burdens on low-income people. And Colorado and Utah, uh, in tandem, having relatively low burdens for poor people in their income taxes. Uh, now, if you look at high earners, well, you expect, oh, New Mexico just is letting those rich, richy riches get off scot-free. Well, not at all. Uh, New Mexico's 28th when it comes to tax burdens on high, in, high earners. So it's a little below, uh, it's heavier than the average state at 28th. Uh, it's below the burdens on low-income people, but it's not great. Nobody says 28th out of 50 is spectacular. Uh, and in this case, uh, Texas is 11th overall, Colorado's 14th, Utah 19th, Arizona 21st, and New Mexico 28th. Uh, it's just an interesting report that shows that when you're, when you're the progressive left-wingers talking about how we've got to uh, revamp our tax code, maybe they should revamp it for everybody not just trying to focus on sticking it to some people and theoretically lowering burdens on the other. Although you don't hear much about gross receipts tax reform and addressing uh, lowering the tax burdens on low-income folks there, Wally. No, you do not. And that's uh, the thing that strikes me that New Mexico's big problem is our gross receipts tax. It's, uh, It's the tax that taxes lots of things. And the exemptions for the gross receipts tax tend to not be things that benefit the poor, with the notable exception of being food and medicine. But if you're really poor, you're not paying gross receipts tax on uh, food if you're on uh, food stamps, uh, supplemental uh, nutrition assistance program, or uh, what it, any of the many names that it goes under. But you're going to be paying it on everything else in New Mexico. And so uh, the one I like to point out to people is when you have a ATM charge, if you're using somebody else's ATM machine than your own bank and they charge you $1.50, there is gross receipts tax on that. And so that really hurts that tax. And again, not ATM charges in specific, the fact that every service in New Mexico is taxed. And as the rates have gone from four to five to six to seven to up to eight and in the nine range, that really has a dramatic impact. And you're right. Uh, Other than a tax increase under the guise of tax reform, uh, what was that? HB six is, uh, there was no discussion of that this session. It just, there was none. I didn't hear anybody saying, 
well, this is something we need to do. We need to look at it during the interim. Uh, the uh, both sides were pretty quiet on this, uh, at least from uh, what I heard. So, yeah, not a lot of discussion about lowering those tax burdens at all. Um, so, uh, I've got a personal story, in fact, uh, about government, and this is a little outside of the norm on uh, what we cover here at this uh, podcast, Tipping Point, New Mexico. Personal story, my uh, sister-in-law, who is uh, not necessarily a high earner, she lives here in Albuquerque, uh, high school graduate and, and uh, has some certifications at the upper, at the you know higher ed level with regard to education, but uh, just a high school diploma. She uh, works in a combination of retail and daycare and uh, decided because budget was tight that she was not going to buy health insurance during 2018. Well, guess what? Uh, our dear former leader, President Obama and his Obamacare has a system of fees and fines set up if you are not interested in purchasing health insurance with all the government benefits you can get. And uh, my wife was doing my sister-in-law's taxes uh, yesterday, uh, this, this weekend, and my sister-in-law got charged $500 for not buying insurance. That is thanks to the Obamacare uh, individual mandate. And, uh, you know, this is not somebody who can easily come up with 500 bucks to pay her insurance. It's uh, shameful that the federal government is engaged in uh, charging people for the privilege, if you will, of not paying an insurance premium every single month. And I know the argument is, well, the system would fall apart if you don't force younger, healthier people into the health insurance pools. But maybe that is the definition of a poor system and that you need to come up with a system that doesn't rely on forcing people who don't want to buy a product to buy a product. Uh, and you know, while this show is uh, often critical of President Donald J. Trump, the tax reform bill that he passed, which actually lowers taxes, unlike what we're talking about here at the state level in New Mexico, that that bill, among its many positive attributes, eliminated the individual mandate. So uh, tangible benefits from federal policy for low-income worker right here in the land of enchantment. Uh, thanks to Donald Trump, uh, no thanks to President Obama, who is unfortunately costing her $500, uh, earning not much above the minimum wage, but enough that uh, they're coming after her for not buying insurance. And uh, we have one final story. Wally, I hate to complain. I really do. I really am a positive person, but when the Albuquerque Journal uh, prints their stories, and I, some of their reporters are really great, and some of them are not so great, but they put a story like, PM firmly supports clean energy initiative. It just makes me want to grab the paper and set it on fire. Uh, let's talk about this in the, sh in the time we have remaining, because... Uh, there's a number of problems that I have with this particular story, but unprompted, uh, tell me a few problems you might have with this, uh, the way this story is portrayed, Wally. Well, you know, it makes P&M sound like the uh, Miss America pageant uh, contestant that's talking about world peace and the environment and beauty and community and rainbows. And uh, I'm sure PNM supports 489, but the uh, the issue is that you, we've talked about a lot is PNM stands to make uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in extra profit by this bill going through at the cost of up to a billion, a billion two by uh, your by the estimate you did, and so uh, to portray this. Uh, solely as the benefits uh, in the in the world of economics everything has a cost and everything has a benefit and particularly when it comes to these political things and so yeah i think that that uh that is not surprising that they are supportive of that legislation but i have a feeling that if you say well what if your uh, shareholder stood 
to have a far lower opportunity to make a profit, would you still be as environmentally supportive as you are now? Or if it had a negative impact on your bottom line, which it would, which it would. Yeah. uh, (laughs) You know, the idea that P&M supports clean energy initiative. Well, uh, yeah, it's also, you could say P&M supports legislation that will directly benefit their profit margins. That's a nice uh, way to put it. Or, P&M supports legislation that will dramatically increase electricity costs for New Mexico consumers. And unfortunately, and Kevin Robinson Avila, he has been at the Albuquerque Journal for a long time. I don't think he is anywhere near their best reporter. Uh, He unfortunately reports on a lot of issues that the Rio Grande Foundation cares deeply about business issues, economic policies, and uh, he does not do a particularly good job of outlining the issues in this story, which was from uh, February. I don't have the exact date on it, but oh, there's more, Wally. Uh, As we all know, the oil and gas industry is destroying roads throughout southeastern New Mexico. And those evil, dastardly people, uh, actually the headline is, oil and gas boom wreaks havoc on southeast New Mexico highways. That is a literally true statement in the sense that, yes, The number of trucks moving into the oil and gas field, carrying products in and out is overwhelming the highways. I was down in Carlsbad a couple years ago before things really got rolling down there and it was already noticeably very busy on uh, that state road 285. Highway 285 is the big road that goes, gosh, uh, I think it goes all the way to Santa Fe uh, and then uh, out east uh, to I-40, like Santa Rosa area, and then comes down to Roswell and goes uh, through Carlsbad all the way into Texas. Uh, you know, Wally, who who manages the roads in the state, especially state highways? <clears throat> <laughs> There's a department, I believe it's called the State Highway Department. And oil and gas has generated a surplus of how much for the state of New Mexico? Oh, uh, over a billion dollars. So... Maybe, maybe it should be the state's responsibility to pro- properly allocate just a small fraction of this billion dollar surplus to making the roads safe, not just for the oil and gas industry, which is obviously using them, but for everybody in Southeast New Mexico who is driving on these roads. Uh, seems like a very simple, common sense approach, but when it's government doing the managing, Nobody, at least not in the media, it seems like, and this one's Ollie Reed. Uh, and it's worth noting, folks, that sometimes the, the reporter doesn't have anything to do with the headline associated with their story more often than not. So, Oh, and that's a great point. I was going to bring that up. Sometimes you can uh, have to blame two people if you don't like the headline and the story. So. Right. And I don't think Ollie Reed uh, does a terrible job with his reporting. It, he doesn't point out that anywhere in his story that the government of the state of New Mexico manages the roads and that uh, he doesn't mention you know necessarily all the money that's coming in and how that could be allocated to it uh, but it, it just it seems like a common uh, sense point to be made that the media conveniently ignores and I'm not going to get into whether this is just incompetence or whether they have an agenda Wally but uh, you, you think that they could maybe do a little better job of explaining how the roads work? Well, I think they do. And uh, I would like them to uh, do the story. And I don't want to pick too uh, harsh on a community, Raton, Tucum Carrier, too, that have really suffered economically. I bet the roads last a long time in Tucum Carrier and Raton. And we don't see the story about how when uh, economic activity goes down and nobody drives on your roads, they last a good long time. I mean, this is a it's crazy. We don't see the other side of the issue. And so, yeah, roads are a crucial, crucial piece of infrastructure. Uh, this issue has been a long time ignored. They keep ignoring it year after year after year, and it didn't even get uh, as much traction as you would have uh, expected during the Martinez administration. But there will come a point where if you uh, if you don't do something with that, the uh, the goose that laid the golden egg, which is the uh, oil and gas industry, will have to slow down because uh, the state of New Mexico can't uh, can't or won't keep up with the roads down there in southeast New Mexico. And again, of course, uh, 
this billion dollar surplus, everybody assumes that it is a somewhat one time kind of deal. Although, uh, you know, prices keep creeping upwards. Uh, production shows no signs of slowing down in the Permian Basin. Uh, and that's the thing that's really uh, different now than it has been is that, yeah, yeah, we had prices uh, five years ago at $100 a barrel or more. Uh, but the production amounts that we've seen in the Permian Basin right here in New Mexico are unprecedented. And that's why New Mexico's risen to the third leading oil and gas producing state in the entire nation. Uh, now, I would be way too demanding to advocate that our dear reporters or headline writers refer to, oh, something like a Davis-Bacon prevailing wage that's imposed uh, that drives up the costs artificially on uh, road construction projects, just as it does on schools, uh, APS. And, uh, oh, maybe a, a certain train that carries a, a very small number of people between Santa Fe and Berlin, uh, technically Berlin, not Albuquerque, although uh, many of the people riding that train, such as they are, uh, go from Albuquerque up to Santa Fe and endure the many stops in between. Uh, it, it just seems that these reporters, uh, and again, you know, that's, I think, the difference between a think tank and a, and a journalist, so to speak, we actually put a little bit more thought and critique and analysis into what we do. And that's why they reporters, a good reporter will come to the Rio Grande Foundation and say, hey, what do you think of, of this? But unfortunately, what we get is uh, the, the what I hate to say, Rush Limbaugh calls the drive-by media. They don't really take the time to actually understand the issue. They just kind of come by with a, a very superficial approach to the issues at hand. Well, and, you know, I will, uh, first of all, completely agree with you. But there also, I would say that uh, in the newspaper business, it's a brutal business right now. Uh, the uh, the money that is being lost, the number of local papers that are going out of business, the fact that uh, we still have an Albuquerque journal to complain about is probably a good sign. And then the other thing that uh, that I will say, and then again, this is not excusing reporters, but uh, Mark Mathis, uh, a former uh, New Mexican who left the state, worked a lot in energy. He was a former TV reporter. He wrote a great book called Feeding the Media Beast. And what it shows is that how much time pressure these reporters are on, and particularly in this current environment, uh, they they've got to get those they've got to get those words, or they've got to get that image if they're TV. They've got to get it in the uh, in the can, if you will, by five o'clock, and they don't have time to look at the underlying issues. And then a lot of these uh, reporters that we get. If you don't like your current reporter today, just wait. You'll get one that has even less knowledge, less experience, and less background potentially t uh, tomorrow. And I saw that a, a lot as well. And so, again, and not to make an excuse, but to just say there are reasons, but it is very disconcerting to see what would you say? It's just, it's 50,000 foot reporting. It's something that, you know, it's like, wow, the roads are torn up. Who tore them up? Oil and gas. Next story, you know, and so maybe we could do a little better. Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, your alternative media, your blogs like errors of enchantment.com, some of what we do. Uh, and I re totally understand the business model of the media. I actually think the journal does a pretty darn good job uh, in the state, it's independently owned, which is great. It's not some big conglomerate, uh, and it's it is worth reading them. You know, I don't honestly think that if you watch television news, and while we love our friends in the TV news biz, they have even less time and capacity to show both sides of the story. And uh, I've dealt with reporters who do a fabulous job on TV with the very limited time they have available, and I've talked to some reporters that just had no stinking clue. And lastly. With regard to Mr. Mathis, and Mathis is a uh, former Albuquerquean. He is a refugee, however, <laughs> now lives in Florida. But uh, he, I have reached out to him to be a possible guest on Tipping Point New Mexico. Uh, and he does. Uh, he did really write the book. I have read that Feeding the Media Beast. If yes. anyone out there wants to learn a great guide for getting media attention, Feeding the Media Beast is the way to go. Mark Mathis did a great job with that particular book. Yeah, and I, I actually was referred the book way before I even met Mark, and it's one of those uh, uh, 
yeah, I learned a lot from that. And I think all of the, uh, all of the ideas that he presented when he wrote the book, probably close to 10 years ago are just as true today. So no doubt about it. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, he, uh, that book was something that I ran across before I started with the Rio Grande foundation as well. He runs a, uh, clear energy alliance.com. If you get a chance to check that out, like I said, I'll be uh, working with Mark to bring him on, uh, in the not too distant future, but that is where we're going to end it. Yes. Uh, always enjoy talking to our friends in the media. Sometimes they even get it right. Uh, but thank you for listening to this week's discussion. We're working every day to turn New Mexico around, go to Rio Grande foundation.org for more information or to support our work. 